Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab, where the tyrant Luft Huron and the warders have refused an order by the Imperial Triumvirate, dispatched by the High Lords of Terra, to surrender themselves to the mercy of the Imperial Expeditionary Force. As a reaction to this, then, the Triumvirate declared the conflict to no longer be a local matter, but instead an imperial war, and denounced the warders as secessionists traitors, and called for all nearby Astartes chapters to rush to the Cartago sector and begin preparations for an invasion of the Autonomous Zone. Unfortunately for the Imperial Triumvirate and the Inquisitors, there were many chapters who actually sympathized a great deal with the Warder's position and their charge to defend the Maelstrom Zone at any cost, yet being constantly refused the tools and resources that they required to do so. There were also many that saw the Imperium's actions here as an imposition upon the Astartes' ancient rights of self-governance and their ability to move freely throughout the Imperium and execute their duty of defending the God Emperor's domain in whatever way they saw fit. Lastly, in the end, the Loyalists, as we shall now begin calling them, did not gather the massive support that they had perhaps hoped for, with the Red Scorpions being the only chapter to send a significant portion of their full strength. This force was, however, augmented by battle companies hailing from the Salamanders, the Raptors, and the Fire Angels chapters. This would of course normally have seen the Loyalists once again outnumbered by the Secessionists, but the hope was that continued warfare against the Firehawks and the Marines Errant had worn down the Warders to the point where they could, if not be outright defeated, then at least forced to surrender and see reason. That, at least, was the initial plan of the Red Scorpion's chapter master, Verant Ortis, who was named the overall military commander of the now Loyalist forces. And so now, the proper war begins, with everything up until this point having been little more than a prologue. <laughs> but. Before we get into all of that, I am forced once more by circumstance to ask you that if you like the video, please do leave a thumbs up and a comment to bring the channel back into its proper standing after the hack, as again, YouTube algorithm is very, very fond of such engagement, and it is, in all due reality, pretty much the only bloody metric it cares about. Now, with the... Uh, soon to be customary shill out of the way. Let's get onto it, shall we? Starting with the loyalist position, and we're also going to discuss how the secessionists viewed this as well, because again, a local war is one thing, a full-scale imperial conflict. Well, maybe the Mantis Warriors and the Lamenters didn't sign up for this shit. But again, let us begin with the loyalists. In overall command of the Imperial efforts to reclaim the Autonomous Zone was of course Legate Inquisitor Jandice Frey of the Ordo Hereticus, but all real military command was left in the hands of Verant Ortis of the Red Scorpions, and he immediately began gathering up his forces for a swift invasion of the Autonomous Zone. He figured that if he could gather all the naval elements of his own Red Scorpions, the Salamanders, the Fire Angels, and the Raptors, along with Battlefleet Solar Reserve elements and anything else that might potentially remain of Battlefleet Cartago, which <laughs> at this point would amount to little more than a handful of escort, if even that, then it was possible to launch a major offensive into secessionist space. 
At first blush, this might seem like a somewhat impetuous course of action. After all, I'm sure quite a few of you are already shouting, but wait, you've tried that already three times and it ended with absolute disaster every single god emperor damn time. But it is ever the reality of warfare that commanders must make decisions based on flawed and incomplete intelligence. The previous operations were not hopeless lost causes. The Tithe fleet was launched because there was no way the warders would fire upon that many Imperial representatives. <laughs> and, well, technically speaking, they, they didn't actually fire upon them on purpose. And the attack towards Iblis, well, it appeared by all suggestions to be a poorly defended world where the Firehawks could force an advantageous confrontation against the Mantis Warriors. They just didn't realize it was a trap. And even the latest Tithe fleet, desperately trying to gather up whatever resources it could still reach, well, it was a desperate Hail Mary to be sure, but it was also Cartago's only remaining realistic chance. They couldn't not take it. And as things stood right now, things were actually looking rather rosy for the newly appointed Lord High Commander Verant Ortis. His information told him quite unequivocally that the Warders had been engaged in heavy fighting against the Marines Errants and the Firehawks for a lengthy period of time now. They had also been trouncing the ever-living nonsense out of Battlefleet Cartago, but even despite winning the overwhelming majority of their battles, the Warders would nevertheless have suffered some casualties, particularly as Stebor Lazarek's Firehawks weren't backing down easy, regardless of how hopeless their position might appear. And as we addressed last episode, Space Marine chapters are simply not designed to deal well with attrition. The Warders must have dug very deeply into their reserves by now. And so Verant Ortis reckoned, quite reasonably so, that if he could arrive in secessionist space with a large, fresh, well-supplied and organized fleet, that might just be enough to finally tip the scales firmly into the Loyalists' favor. Bearing in mind also that Verant Ortis's orders were not to exterminate the warders or seize control of the entire autonomous zone at any cost, it was merely to force the surrender of the warders. And whilst of course Lufthuron had reacted very stridently in the negative to the first call for surrender, that had been issued by an Imperium in no real position to enforce its demands. A reality that was about to change with the arrival of the Red Scorpions and the other battle companies. It was far from inconceivable that when faced with the truth of the situation, Lift Huron would choose to reconsider his previously inflexible stance on surrender. And if he did not, then the Loyalists could simply force the matter by pushing on directly to Badab and delivering the ultimatum right on to the tyrant's doorstep. There was also a second, more nagging reason for why Lord High Commander Ortis could simply not hang back in Cartago and had to push on into secessionist space. Namely, the ever louder and shriller screams and demands of Administratum Tithe Masters. Oh yes. They may say that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, but such paltry fury pales in comparison to the unceasing low-level whine of a thousand administratum drones that aren't getting their cogwheels greased. To be fair, the Imperium was also starting to get into a rather unfortunate position. As we talked about in one of the very first episodes, the Autonomous Zone provides the Imperium with huge quantities of difficult to obtain resources and materials, many of which 
practically cannot be replaced by other resource streams, as they are already completely and fully utilized. And whilst the dozens of sectors in the wider Imperium that have been relying upon the produce of the Autonomous Zone have been able to make do with the shortfall here and there via various shortcuts, improvisations, and tearing into their own reserves, things were starting to get rather dire. You can only really keep producing Coca-Cola for so long until you have to switch over to creating Fanta. <laughs> Credits to whoever gets that reference, by the way. But yes, the Imperium needed the resources to start flowing again. And so one of Commander Ortis's most pressing tasks was the re-establishment of tithe and trade lanes, so that these resources could be gathered and shipped as safely as possible back to the Imperium. The Marines Errant has, as you may remember, tried to do this previously, but they simply did not possess the fleet power required to escort the multitude of convoys through secessionist space and ended up achieving little more than spreading themselves out too thin and getting picked off battle group by battle group. Ortis therefore intended to first and foremost try and settle this via large-scale fleet action. Hopefully, the secessionists would surrender. If that was not possible, then taking into consideration the certain attrition that the warders must have been experiencing, a large-scale, decisive, pitched void battle would be preferable, where the fresh Imperial forces could overcome the exhausted remnants of the Maelstrom Squadron and the warders. If they were not willing to stand and fight, then the matter would be forced. By driving directly towards Badab, Ortis planned to present the Warders with a stark choice. Meet him in the pitch battle that he desired, or potentially lose their capital and center of command. And whilst I fear sounding like a bit of a broken record at this point, the plan looked solid. Whether or not anything would come of it, well, we will have to wait and see. Because whilst Lord High Commander Ortis was marshalling his forces and gathering his allies, we are now going to dip into the secessionist zone for a look into how they are taking things. This of course all started with the destruction of the Tithe fleet. Tarnith Koenig betting that the Astartes would not willingly fire upon official Imperial personnel. And again, they didn't, technically, but the result was much the same. Tarnith Koenig had further wagered that if they were crazy enough to fire upon it, then that would surely bring all of the sympathies of the wider Imperium onto her side, and see the High Lord step into the conflict and force a swift resolution. Which did not happen, because... From any outsider's perspective, Tarnith Koenig's actions appeared uh, careless at the absolute best and like incitement at the worst. The expected support, therefore, was not forthcoming. And for the Warders chapters, it appeared like a straight up act of aggression. And the Lamenters and the Mantis Warriors swiftly rallied behind the Astral Claws who in turn, of course, reciprocated this faith by backing up the Mantis Warriors when they engaged the Firehawks in the Endymion Cluster. The Mantis Warriors perceived the Firehawks as illegitimate invaders of their ancestral territories, whilst the Firehawks, of course, had a somewhat different interpretation of things. And when the Lamenters began striking out against Imperial shipping going through the Pale Stars, their territory, and by Imperial shipping I mean Carthagen shipping, shipping that frequently shot at the Lamenters, once more the Astral Claws fully backed and supported the Lamenters. And of course, 
This comes in addition to centuries of close cooperation as the warders of the Maelstrom. For a period there, it really was all love and harmony. Even the Mantis Warriors, who had remained a rather insulated lot for practically their entire history, were beginning to see the value in having friends and allies. As for the Lamenters, <laughs> they'd been treated like the Imperium's whipping boy for virtually their entire existence. Having someone upon whom they could actually trust must have been a very refreshing experience for them. And as for the Astral Claws, they were clearly reveling in their position as the first amongst equals. A mentor of sort to the rebellious and rambunctious Mantis Warriors and the ill-fated Lamenters. Finally, Cartago had hardly been much of a friend to any one of them, and so they could all quite happily get in line behind the idea of repeatedly dicking on Tarnith Koenig and her friends. Even when the Firehawks came knocking, their first action was to illegally trespass in the Endymion Cluster, and then resist any and all efforts to peacefully resolve the matter, which ended in a violent boarding action. From there, things started spiralling out of control damned rapidly, with the Raptorus Rex and the Firehawks fleet elements arriving once more to piss all over the territorial integrity of the Endymion Cluster. Actions like these, taken on behalf of Cartago and her allies, made them sure that the Lamenters and the Mantis Warriors were in lockstep behind the Astral Claws as they read out the Articles of Just Secession. Even when the Marines' errands arrived, it was viewed as an unfortunate but probably inevitable expansion of a minor local conflict, with the Lamenters of course going to great pains to avoid engaging them in any battle too serious, unless given no choice, of course. And after the seizure of the Sagan Naval Yard and the ambush at Vyania, the Warders considered the war to be essentially over. And whilst the arrival of the Imperial Triumvirate came as a surprise, it was expected to be nothing more than a rubber seal on an already finished conflict. Perhaps negotiations could begin as to modify the Treaties of Just Secession, with increased ratification and guarantees for the independence of the Warders' chapters. But when news came down that the Triumvirate had demanded the immediate surrender of all the Warders' chapters, and that Lufthuron had immediately refused this without consulting Chapter Master Sartark of the Mantis Warriors or Malakim Foros of the Lamenters, that probably came as quite a shock to the latter too. Now, of course, the Astral Claws were the leaders of the Warders' chapters, and as such, Luft Huron, as their chapter master, had complete authority to negotiate or refuse to negotiate on behalf of the Warders as a whole. But the chapters had always strived to maintain a sense of fraternity and mutual cooperation within the Warders. Yes, the Astral Claws may very well be first amongst equals, but that did not mean that the other two did not matter. And asking them to take on the Imperium was an order of magnitude of a bigger ask than simply giving Cartago yet another wedgie. Now, of course, the Mantis Warriors were hardly the most conformist of chapters, and tended towards giving any unwelcome visitors in the Endymion Cluster, be they Imperial or otherwise, the Home Alone 2 treatment. And of course, after the Unhallowed Heart, the Lamenters had thought long and hard about putting their inquisitorial busybodies out the airlock next to their ship. To put it rather bluntly, the Firehawks' ravagers in the Endymion Cluster had not exactly endeared the Imperium to the Mantis Warriors, and the Lamenters… <laughs> uh, well, the Inquisition thing was hardly the first time that the High Lords of Distant Terror had pissed all over their parade. But they would, at the very least, like to be consulted before their leader declares war on that Imperium. 
Chapter Master Sarah Tark, in particular, was not shy about voicing his point of view to Luft Huron, which quite simply amounted to saying that, mistaken or not, the representatives of the High Lords of Terror had found the secessionists to be guilty of severe transgressions against the Imperium. Now, of course, Sartark was more than aware that this was a very one-sided view of events, but the judgement of the High Lords could not simply just be ignored. Right now, they had called for the arrest and the apprehension of the Warders' chapters. That was de facto a declaration of war, but it did stop short of declaring the Warders excommunicatis traitoris. The fact that the Triumvirate had stopped short of issuing this ultimate sanction suggested that there might still be some way of resolving this without it becoming a complete catastrophe. And whilst the tyrant had of course initially outright rejected any talk of surrender, there are indications that he was willing to listen to his fellow chapter masters. But before any sort of fancy pants talking nonsense could begin, diplomacy would have to be continued at least for a while by other means, as the loyalist fleets had amassed and begun their invasion of the autonomous zone. This was a quicker move than the Warders had expected. Their own spies and informers within the Cartago sector had informed them that so far Ortis had only managed to marshal his own Red Scorpions and the Battlefleet Solar Reserves that the Triumvirate brought with them. The remaining battle companies of the Salamanders, the Raptors and the Fire Angels had yet to arrive in battle-ready force. The reason for this was they became clear, as the Red Scorpions and Battlefleet Solar's initial advance, being brazen and bold as if expecting little to no resistance, swiftly turned into a series of small pokes and prods into secessionist space. The new Lord High Commander was trying to get a feel for the opposition that he was going to be facing, the numbers and the disposition of the Warders' navies, and also the remaining strength of the Maelstrom Squadron. Presumably a bit of an unknown element for the Loyalists, as the initial Imperial Navy elements that had been sent in alongside the Warders, well, the latest data on that formation was a few centuries old at this point. It may have withered away to next to nothing, but judging by the casualties inflicted upon Battlefield Elite Cartago and the presence of the Sacred Tektrarch at Iblis, that seemed unlikely. The question then became whether or not the Tyrant had simply maintained his Imperial Navy equivalents, or indeed managed to expand upon it, which as we of course know, he had. And this was quickly becoming obvious to the loyalists as well, as all of their little pokes, their prods, and their testing thrusts were not only met, but ferociously counterattacked. Over the course of the coming few months, dozens of small to medium scale skirmishes were fought up and down the borders of the Star Cluster with both sides trying to get a general grip and idea of what the other was up to. The secessionists were not entirely sure whether or not this was the initiation of a large-scale military offensive or open conflict, or if it might be yet another step in their ongoing war of words with the Administratum and the High Lords, remembering once more that the legal battle had been ongoing for centuries at this point. So you can hardly blame them for wondering whether or not this was simply diplomacy by other means, or a genuine attempt to break into secessionist space. This confusion and lack of clarity resulted in the majority of the fighting falling upon the shoulders of the Maelstrom Squadron, with the Astral Claws, Lamentis and Mantis warriors taking a stand back and observe approach, unwilling to engage fully and openly in a way that might deepen the divide and inflame the conflict yet further, at the very least until they could be absolutely certain that this was truly a no-holds-barred fight. 
The Red Scorpions and Battlefleet Solar element on their sides continue to increase the rapidity and ferocity of their attacks in an attempt to find a weak spot that surely must be somewhere. After all, again, the enemy should be stretched dangerously thin at this point, and yet whatever they went, they ran into Maelstrom Squadron's formations and the odd occasional naval elements of the warders as well. Eventually, the largest single battle took place between the Death World of Gree and the Frontier World of Galen. This void battle with the Red Scorpions and Battlefleet Solar elements on the offensive versus a defending formation of the Maelstrom Squadron was quite typical of the engagements during this part of the war, with neither side being particularly interested in losing any valuable fighting strength, engaging at maximum range, taking de facto pot shot at the other side, hoping and waiting for any kind of mistake or break in their formation. They had been trading the occasional ship here and there for months, but in this engagement, it was the Maelstrom Squadron that made the largest mistake. During one of the many small skirmishes between the two battle lines, the Overlord-class battlecruiser Gauntlet of Wrath had its primary bridge knocked out by an extraordinarily fortuitous lance strike from the light cruiser Lady Sibellini of Battlefleet Solar. Usually, the Gauntlet of Wrath's void shields would have been more than enough to deflect any haphazardly fired lance volley from a light cruiser, but perhaps due to the qualities of the Battlefleet Solar crew, or simply one of those million to one happenstances that occur with such frightening frequency in warfare, it didn't happen this time and the command crew of the Gauntlet of Wrath had not evacuated to the secondary armoured bridge. And thusly, when the land strike struck, virtually the entire command and control structure of the battlecruiser was annihilated in one single blow. As a result of this, the battlecruiser, bereft of control, bereft of command, veered sharply out of formation, separating itself from its escorts and presenting the nearby Red Scorpion strike cruisers with a tantalizing target. You don't present the God Empress Adeptus Astartes with such an opening and expect to get away with it. Lightningly swift, the Red Scorpion strike cruisers closed the distance, placed themselves in between the Gauntlet of Wrath and its escorts separating them, and with point-blank range barrages and rapidly organized boarding parties, they crippled her shields, her engines, and her weapons, leaving her as nothing more than a shattered, burnt-out husk drifting through the void, before the Red Scorpions themselves, having collected their raiding party, swiftly exited the theatre of battle before the Maelstrom Squadron could offer any truly threatening response. Having now returned to the status quo of two battle lines sniping at one another, but having lost their biggest ship, the Maelstrom Squadron had no choice but to turn tail and retreat into the war leaving the Loyalists with a tentative victory. But even successes like this were few and far between, with the overwhelming majority of the confrontations resulting in little more than relatively light damage on either side. The occasional torpedo might sneak through an intercept net here and there, a lucky lance battery might score a significant hit, as we saw with the Gauntlet of Wrath. But by and large, the two sides were simply pummeling at one another beyond the truly effective range of their weaponry, achieving little more than minor damage, overloading the occasional void shield here and there, and scouring some armor plating. Considering the intensity of the previous phase of the conflict, this was an odd war indeed, where both parties seemed quite content to merely tickle the other ever so gently, with the occasional pinch thrown in for good measure. Though the two parties were also becoming ever more wary of one another, 
If Lord Commander Ortis had expected to be able to finish this war with a swift, overwhelming show of force, perhaps even encouraging a surrender, he had been quite thoroughly dissuaded of this point of view, as not only had the Maelstrom Squadron clearly grown in both size and competency, to the point that now they were trading on quite equal terms with Battlefleet Solar and the Red Scorpions, but there were also a hell of a lot more warders around than he had expected. The primary engagements were fought with the Maelstrom Squadron, but the warders were never far away, always close by, just out of reach, watching and waiting, and any real attempts to dive deeper into Sessionist space always found itself blocked by a larger Astartes navy. For an enemy supposedly on the brink of collapse through attrition, there sure was an awful lot of warders still around, particularly the Astral Claws, despite having engaged the Firehawks in ferocious ground battles through the Golgothan Wastes, they seemed to be everywhere, and not in any diminished numbers either. And meanwhile, on the other side of the front line, the warders found any potential advances towards Cartagon space now completely blocked by Battlefleet Solar and Red Scorpions. They may have had a chance earlier with a lightning assault towards Cartago, but the optimistic notion that there might be some surrender upcoming and the need to fortify the Sagan system had seen them miss their window, and now, whilst they did launch the occasional poke and prod in return, the moment had clearly come and gone. They also felt the need to further fortify the space around the Surengrad system, which was still holding on as a loyal imperial fortress world. Up until this point, the Warders hadn't really paid it all that much attention beyond establishing a blockade of the system, for whilst it was an imposing fortress world, it did not possess a navy, and so they could have as many millions or billions of troops as they wanted so long as they were all effectively stuck on a single planet. If the Red Scorpions and the Loyalists managed to slice through the Secessionist defences, however, and link up with Sorengrad, that would be a much larger problem, as now suddenly they would have access to a massively heavily fortified base in the heart of Secessionist space. That would be very unfortunate indeed. And to make matters worse, the Warders still were not really in any position to take on Surengrad directly. They had hoped to maybe deal with the Fortress World using their full strength once the war was beginning to wind down with the seizure of Sagan and possibly an invasion of Cartago, but with that avenue of approach no longer available to them and facing yet larger Imperial forces, there was no way the Warders could commit their entire strength to deal with one fortress planet. Luckily, there are more than one way to skin a cat, and the Tyrant had been making some plans for quite some time that were about to come to fruition. As the situation stands then, the Loyalists pushing into Secessionist space had not really achieved much. A optimistic observer might credit them with stopping the Secessionist advance, granted this being something that the Secessionists themselves had pretty much already done when they halted to fortify the Sagan system and reinforce their borders, but hey, details. Don't let that get in the way of optimism after all. But despite Commander Ortis being relatively happy with what he had been able to achieve, and considering he was at this point in time only utilising his own Red Scorpions and the Battlefleet Solar, he would have been hard pressed to achieve anything more anyways. The Inquisition, however, were not quite so satisfied. They had been hoping for a swift and decisive end to the conflict, 
Uh, perhaps even the reason why the Imperial Triumvirate had been so strident in their demand for the Warders' surrender was because, like Commander Ortis, they assumed the Warders were close to collapse, and figured they would take any rope thrown to them with which to climb themselves out of a well. And that, of course, turned out to not quite be the case. This placed the Triumvirate in a tiny bit of an awkward position. Everyone has a boss, after all, and even the Inquisitorial Lords of this new expedition had those higher up on the pecking order than them eagerly awaiting reports of progress in the Autonomous Zone and the immediate resumption of resource shipments. And with that clearly being an impossibility, the Triumvirate proceeded on to the tried and tested middle management tactic of finding someone upon whom to shift the blame. Fortuitously for the Triumvirate, who had just recently set up headquarters on the planet Sidon Ultra, the previous capital of the Cartago system, the massive jail cells beneath their new palace was absolutely filled to the brim with scapegoats. It was time for Tarnith Koenig and her compatriots to provide the Imperium with one final service. In a series of wildly publicized court proceedings, the Triumvirate found fault with, well, everything they could reasonably find fault with and a few things they couldn't. Taking plentiful time to grandstand, the Triumvirate condemned the Cartagen elite's reckless and dangerous behavior, their lunatic actions not merely causing damage to Cartago, but widespread interruptions to Imperial production. As a result, the God Emperor's domain had suffered terrible deprivations and losses. Imperial Guard regiments had gone without tanks, hive cities without water filtration systems, Navy task force without fuel. Trillions of lives had been impacted, and only the Emperor alone would ever truly know the scale of hurt brought onto his realm by the perfidious actions of Cartago. No more, the judges declared, justice would be served. Justice for imperial society above all. But the actions of Tarnith Koenig and her allies were too vile to be adequately condemned by a mere court of her peers. And so she and her closest compatriots were dispatched immediately to the only authority that could adequately judge such treachery. The God Emperor himself express ticket, the Inquisitorial Firing Squad. But of course, such crimes could not possibly be repaid with such a lenient penalty as mere death. The starving multitudes of the Imperium could not be fed of such justice. They required an, an equitable solution. And truly, the Triumvirate asked, could Tarnith Koenig and her like have committed these most horrifying transgressions unaided? No, they had help. The soldiers of the Cartagen PDF, the sailors of her navy, and yes indeed the very people themselves had facilitated this faithlessness and failed in their duty to overthrow such clear and blatantly incompetent governance, and thusly the Imperium would have its due from the guilty parties. Starting with the forced deportation into labor camps of every man, woman and child on Sidon Ultra, 14 billion citizens were bound to serve the Imperium in whatever way it saw fit for no less than six generations. But it was not to end there. A mere 14 billion could not possibly repay all the debt that Cartago had acquired. Adeptus Administratum rectification programs would be dispatched to every Cartagen world to determine its level of complicity. 
and Adeptus Arbites officers would then facilitate the full repayment of all outstanding tithes directly from the population and planets themselves, using whatever measures and whatever time was necessary to do so. The labour would probably take a millennia, but the most holy Inquisition's good works are never in vain. And sooner or later, justice will have been extracted in full from the people of Cartago. A just and fair, measured punishment, no doubt. I'm actually just a little bit surprised that the Red Scorpions went along with it. They do have a touch of the Salamander in them and tend to side with the little guy. This also seems clear indication that the Salamanders had not arrived in system in any real force just yet. Otherwise, I can't imagine them not objecting quite vociferously as well to this treatment of what was in all due essentiality in... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Guilty as all hell, population. <laughs> of course. But to be fair, Ortiz had weightier matters on his mind. His little pushes, pokes and prods into secessionist space had not revealed an enemy ready to collapse. Instead, it had shown a well-formed, organised, led and equipped Maelstrom Squadron which the Loyalists had undoubtedly hoped would be nothing more than a shadow of its once relative glory. And then there were the Warders, who were seemingly everywhere, but reticent to engage in open conflict, making it difficult for Ortis to judge their true strength, but the sheer number of observations of enemy vessels suggested it was a lot more than he was hoping for. He was now also, however, able to receive debriefings and reports from the Firehawks and the Marines Errant, who had also passed beneath the scrutiny of the Triumvirate, but had been found to be free of taint. They had acted in good faith when Cartago called for help, and had not been a direct participant in Cartago's misdeeds, which, in the case of the Firehawks, should tell you all you need to know about the uh, priorities of the Triumvirate. But, moral or not, guilty or not, Lord Commander Ortiz was not in a position to be choosy about his allies and would take any help he could get. The Firehawks informed him that during the campaigns through the Golgothan Wastes, which they had eventually escaped, to turn themselves in to the Inquisition after their fire bombing of Sir Christian, which turned out to be nothing, a uh, secessionist fantasy, <laughs> I'm sure. Anywho, they reported that the Astral Claws had been fighting them constantly, and judging by the Firehawk's own casualties, the Astral Claws should be severely reduced at this point which didn't fit in at all with Lord Commander Ortis's own reports. Something was off about this, but on the other hand, the Firehawks had proven themselves to be a rather reckless chapter on more than one occasion quite recently, and he was not entirely convinced of their accounts. They sounded, um, rather inflated, one might say. The Marines' errant came across as far more reliable and honest, but... To be somewhat blunt, they had had their asses handed to them on silver platters, and were as such not really in the best position to give accurate estimates as to the strength of the enemy that had so thoroughly trunched them. Nevertheless, Firehawks and Marines Errants would provide Ortis with more cards to play. Pushing towards the direction of Sorengrad was clearly not happening, and so he needed to find a new target, a new focus for his forces. And luckily, there was one fairly nearby. After the ambush of the Marines' errants near Vyanya, the surrounding systems had fallen under complete secessionist control, along with all of their resources. But judging by the relatively slow advance of the Warders and their allies, 
it was reasonable to assume that most of that bounty was probably still located in the general system. Furthermore, it was the most recent acquisition of the warders, hence it was likely to be the least defended and the least fortified. If the loyalists were to secure a quick early victory, Vyania was the place to get it, and so Ortiz began reorganizing his forces. The Firehawks were sent to guard the borders of Cartago, alongside the Raptors, who had just recently arrived. With his flank thusly secured, Ortiz gathered up his own Red Scorpions and what remained of the Marines' errants for the offensive towards Vyania, when two pieces of very good news arrived. The first was that apparently Vyanya was not particularly fond of their new masters, and reports of increasing unrest and general upheaval and uprisings were arriving all the time. It would appear that the iron fist of the tyrant had not yet quite closed, and loyalist forces might still be operational within the system, and further auxiliaries could, perhaps, be raised from the civilians resisting the regime. And the second piece of good news, even more decisive, was the unexpected arrival of the Nova Marines. This must have come as quite a surprise, because the chapter had not announced any intentions of joining in the war effort, nor had they contacted the Triumvirate or Ortis. As to precisely why they showed up now out of nowhere is unclear. The Nova Marines are of course a second founding Ultramarines chapter, and like the Marines errant, they also go to sleep whilst hugging the Codex Astartes, so mayhaps they figured that like-minded friends of theirs had been getting their asses stomped by mean evil secessionist heretics, and so sent a formation to help. Or, perhaps, they didn't inform the Inquisition because, like many Ultramarines, they occasionally take a dim view of the Emperor's most holy of servants. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the Inquisition has cast more than one dubious glance toward Ultramar over the years, so I wouldn't be surprised. And it might not even be such a roundabout reason at all either. The Nova Marines have a habit of dispatching troops to battle zones far away from their home world for no other particular reason than because they do it. <laughs> and that's pretty much all the rationale they need. Not like anyone's going to look up um, the arriving Space Marines come to save them and go, well, you're awfully far from home. W weren't there anyone closer? <laughs> no, not really. And this was a valuable addition to Ortis's strike force, who had previously consisted mostly of red scorpions and whatever battered remnants of the marine's errands he could gather up. With fresh reinforcements, the loyalist offensive towards Vyarnia was looking far more likely to succeed, with or without populist support. But then again, we've seen previous optimistic loyalist offensives, haven't we? We have read this chapter before. Whether or not Ortis will be able to change the ending is yet to be seen. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.